evening from James. I'm sorry, it's going to be Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 25. We'll begin reading. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 25. Oh, don't you love Jesus being so wonderful? We talk about the scripture often, but these, these testimonies, so meaningful. When the Lord said, you're made an overcomer, how? The blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You're testifying every day whether you're using words or not. People's watching our lives. The scripture says we're epistles. Known and read of all men. And let me tell you, they're watching you. They're watching us and they should watch us. And Brother Mess is talking about this morning. They should be able to see Jesus in us at the most inopportune time. Jesus is still Lord. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So every situation is brought under the precious hand of Jesus Christ. Look with us here. We are in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 25. Wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. <clears throat> Neither give to the devil. Steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. Lord, we bow in your presence. We thank you for your word. And we ask you, Lord, let your anointing Rest upon the preaching of your word and for these things we praise you. Lord, we want to do what we can, but we want you to do what we cannot do. Lord, only you can tag the heart. Only you can change the soul. Only you can see tomorrow. Only you have guidance and leadership through the storms of our life. But Lord, we're asking you to do what we can't do today. Yeah. Magnify yourself. Magnify your word. Yeah. And for these things we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. <clears throat> I was so proud. Brother Clay's made it to the two-bit preacher part. <laughs> In the old language, two bits was a quarter, four bits was 50 cents, <laughs> and six bits was 75 cents. <laughs> So he made a two-bit preacher. Brother, I'm proud of you. Give me all of them two-bitters that can win somebody to Jesus. Yeah! Whoa! Going to a church that's been closed three times and said, we're willing. If God wants us, we're willing to go. Whoa! Wonderful. They was with us at the, and the, the children too was with us at the meeting in La Mesa. And it's just a, every time we get to visit, it's like family. We're getting back together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a rich world. I, I was telling one of our, uh, well, his brother Phil 
uh, Philip McGeechee, he's our uh, men's director over the district. And I tell him, I said, well, hey, we have another minister with us. I, I didn't think he had met Brother Ross. And I said, he's our chaplain there at Price Daniel. And he says, is he one of us? I said, yeah. He said, he's a assembly of God. I said, yeah, born and raised, A.G. <laughs> well, that's pretty important we, when you want a, a, you know, fellowship of like, minded believers because everybody don't believe the same thing a lot of people they preach like crazy but they don't believe the bible they're just a bunch of religious thugs but if you can preach what jesus said then you got something <laughs> you got a message it's real that's going to last forever amen okay here we go <clears throat> i want to talk to you this evening <clears throat> about the power of speech the power of speech one writer, his name was Jerry Harville, said, Peace, purity, and power prove Christian life. Actually, the way we talk tells the story of our walk. It comes out in our language. Not just body language, but the verbal language. It seeps out through the cracks. It can be holy and it can be good or it can be otherwise. But there is power in what you say to people. Amen. There's power there. Just like Brother Ross was talking about, to look at somebody that's such, done such horrible things and to be able to tell them that God loves you. Oh, thank you. It's incredible because they're looking, they're guilty of sin, they're caught, they can't get away. That's one thing about the jail ministry or prison ministry. You don't have to ask them if they've been wrong. No. <laughs> the sentence tells you that much. And like, unlike church people that won't cough it up and say I'm crooked, right. Come on. I'm the guys in the prison know they was or they wouldn't be locked up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that makes you a different preacher. <laughs> I went to the jail to help them and they changed my ministry. <laughs> 1979, man, the Lord rode me around for a whole week. I said, I'll go. I'll go live down there. God, whatever it takes. But anyway, it was, um, it was a, a terrible beating, but it was a wonderful. The Bible says that no chastening at the moment seemeth joyous, but afterwards it does something. It yields out the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Man, I was just going to take the club in and go on and do my thing, but I couldn't stand it. <laughs> he beat me mushy. <laughs> and I needed it. I was stubborn. Well, in my condo looking up here, it was. <laughs> but the Lord drove it out of me. Woo! Glory. Okay. So the power of speech. To given. Notice the, the statements uh, down through life that's kind of got a hold of you. Like, like little things, cliches like, uh, be careful how you put your words out. You may have to eat them later. You know, li little things like that just kind of go, you know, and hang on to you. Or kind words left unsaid, they cost so little, but they mean so much. Wow, little, little things that, that's been said. Uh, what, what about the gentleman that defies the forces of England and the British and everything they stand for and says with a scream and a snarl, give me liberty or give me death and, and was willing to die. What about the sea captain that the British honk him? They, they know he can't make it. And they, they, they toot over that horn. They send him a message that says, are you ready to surrender? And I mean, his ship's going down. He said, I have an even yet started to fight. And he boarded their ship and took it. Amen. He boarded their ship. Hey, hey, give the Lord a shout of praise. The Lord intended an America to be here. And friends, we're not here by chance. America is here by God's authority. I don't know how much longer it can stay, but I'm praying like you've been talking about. God, touch us. Touch our nation. Touch our people. Touch our states. Touch our Congress people. Touch the man that thinks he's leading the world. 
Touch us, Lord, every one of us. Touch our preachers. Really, the truth, if you just sawed all the legs off the idiocracy and got down to the truth, the reason that America is in the state it is today is what Brother Clinton has said years ago, one of the first times I ever heard him preach, that America's going to hell because of the preacher behind the pulpit that wouldn't rise up and say, thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> Our preachers as a whole are preaching for money, not preaching the truth. That's where it's went to. It's a business. And look what it's cost our nation. <clears throat> that being said, we're carriers of the gospel, every one of us. And so we want to we wanna be so, so good at what we're doing, but we've got to do it in a good way, in love. There's, there's words that, that hang in the balance of our life. It's stuff like this. Can't you do anything right? The power of speech. When you say that to a child or a young person or a middle-aged adult or a person that's lived their whole life, it's such a painful thing that for them to know that that's the way you feel about their life. Whether it's good or bad, those words, those words cut and they're powerful. What about these? He is such a jerk. Powerful words. If you just leave them out there, it's like you hit them with a baseball bat. What about all the people there are just hypocrites? <laughs> Woo! Y'all are loving me now. Did you see her? She was flirting. Okay. And it could go on. I mean, there's, there's no end to what can be said. And sometimes over jealousy or anger or there's all kinds of things that makes us, I'm talking about us as humans, get down and, and say stuff that's really, that shouldn't be said. It, even, you know, God can help us somehow to, uh, I know just in conversation we say stuff to each other and about different parts of stuff. But when you look, when you identify a person and look at them and say something real hard, it's unforgettable. And so the power of speech, I want us to carry it to the other side of the fence and, and be powerful in setting people up to be more Amen. than conquerors. The power of speech. And what happens when we, when we really go to looking our speech over, we're getting a taste of what we really are when we're not in church. What carries the weight in our conversation tells the story on what's on the inside of us. Here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, look what he says. <clears throat> Wherefore putting away lying. And then he uses this word, speak. To speak, something's got to come out. But what he says, speak every man truth. Now, you can, you can say somebody is crazy or an idiot or whatever, uh, or that that was a bad way to do it, but there's a way to say stuff without being, there is constructive criticism. I mean, if, okay. Now, in verse number one, we're called by God to be different. And this is why we want to get a hold of our speech in such a way that we can get this down. And he, he puts it in walking terms. My mother is so proud that she can walk. She's been walking for probably since she's two years old. But she's 92 now and fixing to be 93. And I was up there yesterday and she had her uh, some little light jeans on and a shirt and she hadn't been able to wear it much hardly over that scar except real soft and little jersey britches and stuff but uh, she just she's getting better and she followed me to the door she said I wish I could get out there and cut them weeds she says I love killing weeds <laughs> when she's able to get out she says get up here and sharpen my hole yes ma'am boy I mean I get her holes I get them in the vice and I get my grinder out and I sharpen them things up I mean if you run your finger down them and cut it off she said, I like a sharp hole. Man, when she hits them, she wants to hear that weed go click when you're cutting, cutting weeds. I love killing weeds. 
Yeah, she's so happy. She wanted to walk. And so here he talks about in verse number one of this passage. And as we, what he's talking about, as we walk our life out and we're getting out around people, what we're saying in our walk is affecting us. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. I belong to somebody. He's saying this with great joy. I am a prisoner. Not at Price Daniels or Scurry County Jail, but he says, I belong to somebody. I'm all locked up in Jesus. Beseech you. And then he puts these words in there that you do what? Walk worthy of your vocation or your workplace spiritually wherewith you are called. Whatever you're doing for God, be at the top level as much as in you is. Our talents is really not what God needs. He needs our totality, giving it, giving it all. If you can do it just because you're talented, you don't have to depend on the Lord. But if you're goofy like me, if God don't help you, you're ruined. But if he comes and helps you, all of a sudden what can be nothing can begin to flourish. Whoa, and you say, God, you, whoa, he'll do it again. Wow. Just take a look at where you've been. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it just makes you so proud to see God helping you, helping you take a step. And so he's talking about walking this out. On down in verse number 13, he uses this word again. He says, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And he's, he's bringing this walk into this. How far are we going to walk? How far are we going to go with Jesus? Till we all come into unity. Man, we're going to walk on with him until we get his knowledge. The knowledge of the Son. Whoa. Until we become a perfect man. That's lots of walking. That's going to last till Jesus calls us home. We're walking this through not just one day or just holding it in till we can get by him. But this becomes our nature. Nature, the way we are. Whoa. I saw a deal the other day on YouTube. It's really funny. This guy, you know, goats just do what goats do. And this goat was running around wanting to butt everybody. So this kid, he puts him a helmet on. And he, you know, like he's, <laughs> like, like when you run together at the football team. <laughs> and that goat <laughs> Rared up and butted him, but he, he put the smoke on him. <laughs> Hell, but no. Don't you think that, I mean, we got to have some understanding. We're not just here to get run over. We got to use some, some common sense, <laughs> some Bible sense. Lord, help me. Coach me. I don't want to just get out there and get a black eye for the sake of getting beat up, but Lord, if I'm going, let me go in the authority of the Lord and let my speech be so powerful. Maybe it's just shutting up that makes it strong. Sometimes just to hold it in and say nothing. Our walk is so important that we can go clap it down. Maybe we need the goat to come running to it just before we get. Amen. Woo! So he's talking about walking worthily with the Lord. Now, we're asking God as we're going through this walk, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, make our words heal rather than hurt. And that's how we walk it out in a worthy way. It would be easy to say, you bunch of thugs in the prison system, you know, you got there, you need to go to hell. I mean, that's flesh. But you know, I could be there or you could be there if somebody hadn't uh, prayed, loved on us, talked to us. Sang to us, drug us to church, <laughs> took us to revival. <laughs> Man, poured the word of God in us, talked to us before we went to school. Man, where would we be if somebody hadn't stopped and said, come on, I know you're goofy, but you know what? God, going to make a difference in your life. Get in here and let's try to go together. Well, we've all sinned. We've all come short. So there shouldn't be this palette of self-righteousness that we get to stand on and say, we're just a little bit. No, we're not, friends. We're down. And I mean, that humility is what makes our language clearer. Walk worthy is you get out and recognize, Lord, I, I don't want to bring hurt. How can I answer this? Because if you live, there's going to be some time when you can really put it on somebody. And they may deserve it. But it's not God's way. 
So he said, walk worthy. Another passage in verse number 17, he talks about here, this is a different walk than the way we've walked before. This I say there and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. You know how you used to walk, but you can't walk that way. No more. Our walk is new. Our walk is refreshing. Wow. I, I was reading a, a book by Bat, Bat, Master, Bat Masterson. And I, I thought, man, this is such a powerful statement to me. But man, it, it's talking about people that's bored, you know, with church and all. And he said, the reason you're bored is because you're not hungry. Oh, come on, brother. And he said, the reason you're not hungry is because you're full of yourself. <laughs> if you're full, you don't want nothing. You're so up. It's when we empty ourselves that we get so hungry for God that God, if I have to crawl to that altar, God, I'm coming. I'm so, it ain't about me no more. It's about I'm, I'm hungry for God. We should have revival and there shouldn't be a seat in the building or the Coliseum or the square. I mean, as crazy as our world is right now, friends, revival, you should be able to light a toothpick and it burn the whole community down. I'm talking about spiritually. But people have got so full of mm, 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 that they have no hunger for God. What a statement. What a mind boggle. You know, Wednesday night come around. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or Sunday night or revival or life for the our church is so precious. I, I appreciate that. But I mean I see churches emptying up all over the and I'm not just talking about Methodist back whatever. I'm talking about the AG churches. No Wednesday night service, no Sunday night service. You got a multi-million dollar complex and you open it one hour on Sunday and they're mad at you then. Yeah. Right. What we, we really didn't want to come. You know why? We're so full. Not a God. Woo! You're not hungry for God. There's a reason. Boy, I thought he put it on the top shelf. He'd like to knock me off my chair. Woo! So our walk must be different. Our walk is not as other Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. Vanity means that we're so caught up in doing stuff that has no eternal are you out there? We're so caught up in doing stuff that has no eternal value that we don't have time for God. Woo! And our speech is telling our story. Our walk must change. If we follow Jesus, we must not only talk the talk. We got to walk. We got to walk the walk. Woo! So Christianity is being defined in a different way than non-Christians. He said we're different here. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you walk, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. So he said there's got to be a difference between you and the person that don't know Christ. And if there's not, you don't know him. Woo! There's got to be a difference. The third walk he talks about is in chapter 5 and verse number 2. This is to walk lovingly. And I know you're thinking, oh, lovey-dovey, just hunky-dory. But really, friends, if you love people, you love them so much you can't let them go by without telling them there's an eternity out there. And I just got to tell you that Jesus loves you, but you got to be saved. Like Brother Russ talking about, those men got all kinds of problems, but friend, Jesus is the fixer of problems. He's our great healer. He's our friend. He's the friend of the publican. He saved the thief. Are you still out there? He saves the thief on the cross. He grinds old saws down to powder <laughs> with a light <laughs> until he's saying, okay, who are you, Lord? And he said, Jesus answered him, I, I am Jesus whom you persecute. 
Whoa, man, I mean, he's shook. But he's changed. His vocabulary changed. His way of life changed. His walk, his walk has changed. But you know why? He begins to love the Jesus he's hated so much. He loves him. He fell in love with him. And his walk has changed. In chapter, chapter 2, verse number 5, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You see what kind of love you're talking about? This is sacrificial love. This is, this is giving, a giving over of ourselves. And we should, we should smell good when we get through about it. Now, I did it, but I'll, t- <laughs> I'll thank you. <laughs> Don't you know the Lord's coming back after the bride is doing like it? Oh, no. no? Is that the one you want to get married to, Brother Clay? Oh, me neither. No! No! He's looking for the bride that's crying. Eva! So come! Lord Jesus! And they did something. They love not their life unto death. They were not full of self. They was hungry for Jesus. Woo, glory. Man, so Christian words are defined in verse 29 of Ephesians chapter 4. They're defined as good. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. as good. They're defined as constructive. <laughs> good to the use of what? Edifying. Edifying. What does edify mean? Does that tear down or build up? So it's saying our word, if we're Christians, our word should be good words. And our word should be constructive words that we edify, we build them up. We know they've been like us, lost. But now, whoa, I can't believe that boy wants to pay his tithe when the second time he's at the church house. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Man, I'll tell you, when you get saved, that touches your pocketbook. You're a new creature. Whoa, old things have passed away. Man, the whole jail was shocked. I was preaching like crazy one day, and this guy, when he got through, he's a dope dealer. He had, he had a, I mean, he, I don't know, he had several hundred dollars in commissary. Rich, he come in there with a big old roll of bills, been selling dope. He told the, he got on the deal, the intercom, and 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 uh, told that uh, told the jailer to pay his ties out of that as I went out. <laughs> They're like, ah! <laughs> I can't believe the preacher coming to jail and stealing money. <laughs> now I went, I went the whole time. I mean, from '79 till till 2015 of uh, March. No, 2020 of March, uh, until the COVID shut us off. But anyway, not, not for money, for the souls. But God bless my heart. I just thought, it's incredible. He gets saved in there and he can give this some of that dope money. <laughs> oh, how I love Jesus. Man, you get right. Yeah, you know what's going to happen? Your words are going to change. You're going to have some good words. You're going to have some words that edify. They're going to be constructive. They build up. Construction is about building. It's not about tearing down. <laughs> that plucker down. <laughs> I know I'm, I like to run these messages together, but I'm not going to do it. Hush, 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 hush. Uh, these words are appropriate. Wow. Do you remember the scripture? The, the word, how, how good or, let's see, what, what is it? Uh, or, forcible yeah, how forcible words. I, I can't get the scripture down. Just zip my mind. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Anyway, I can't think. Anyway, how forcible are the words when they're set at the right time? Right, right, on, right on the mark. Man, it just makes them powerful. And so your words... The words are, are powerful if you can get them out in the right way. If we can get them out as good, constructive, appropriate. If you go back to our scripture there in, in uh, verse 29. <clears throat> okay, thank you, brother. How forceful are right words. There you go. But what doth your arguing reprove? <laughs> Isn't that good? Job 6 and 25. But powerful. Thank you, John, for giving us that. Go, go back to 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What it's saying here that our words must be appropriate. 
that no corrupt communication means that our words got to be appropriate as a Christian. Now, don't, don't get dismayed when you get around people that's lost. Whatever they say or however they say it, that, that's the sinner's world. But Christians got to be different and our language has got to be different. He's talking about here, it's got to be good, it's got to be constructive, and it's got to be appropriate. And sometimes, friends, you just got to stop and say, God, how could I answer this in an appropriate way? Wow. Don't you love Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? The king's got them hemmed up in a corner. He's heated the fire seven times hotter than it wants to be heated. He's got his magna army men, the very colonels of the generals of the top of the echelon, right there to throw them bound into the fiery furnace. And he says, now I've got to tell you something. I'm going to give you one more chance. What have you got to say? And they said, you talk about appropriate words. O oh, king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. The God that we serve will deliver us. But if he don't, we will not vow and he will deliver us out of your hand one way or the other Woo! you talk about put it on the line i mean the king he goes he, he, they didn't cuss him or nothing like that they just said we're not going to bow and guess what they didn't bow because their words were so appropriate so pure they didn't give no no two years of supreme court justice nothing we're here before god and so are you so do what you got to do Woo! appropriate. Our words must be good. They must build. They must be constructive. They must be appropriate. And here in this verse, he gives us one more thing. <clears throat> they must minister grace. Whew. Grace is not because they deserve it. <laughs> grace is what we got. Yeah. That's why we're not in hell. It's because he gave us grace. So, man, these, these Christians, these Christian words, man. And wouldn't we all jump at the occasion to use this kind of language? Yet, they are anything but the practice that we make. And why is that? And here's the reason. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Friends, you can't just doctor your word list and stay clean. What's got to happen is your heart has got to be washed so pure that your communication becomes good, constructive, appropriate, come on now, and full of grace. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned, how? Seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer everybody. There's some questions that your act is like, so here comes a gentleman today. We're sitting at the table. Connie Tucker took Nancy back. And so me and Randy was eating at a, at a restaurant. And this, this gentleman come and sat down at the table. And he said, uh, he, worked, he worked there at the restaurant. He said, I'd just like to ask you a question. My son is 17. He's uh, dating a girl that's 18. She had a baby before he started dating her. They've been living together some. He wants to marry her. Everybody has said don't marry, you are too young. What do you think? And I said, well, it really doesn't matter what I think, but I'll tell you what the Bible says. It's better to bear, marry than it is to burn. And I said, if I was going to counsel your son, I would say, either move out or go get you a marriage license because you're balancing on the realm of eternity without God. And nothing's worth that. And he said, I'm going to tell him what you said. I said, I hope you do, Button. And I, he said, if he called you, would you talk to him? I said, by all means. Tell him to write his questions down. The Bible's got the answer. Amen. Yes. You know what? There is hope, friends. And look, look at the craziness. The marriage has been run from for years, the last 20 years. It's like nobody wants to get married. They're, they're, we don't want to do so. Like we just rather shack up. I told him, I said, shacking up puts you in hells. Yeah. I mean, it puts the fire right on you. You're, you're, you're riding the target. But if you, if you get clear of that, then God, he's going he's to give it and get us past it. In verse number 31, 
Paul gives us a profile on the feelings that raise evil talk. We get a good look, a good look at what causes evil talk to come out. Bitterness. Wrath. Anger. Whoa. Boy, when those things, when those things are living inside, what comes out of you? Oh man, I, I was preaching like crazy at the at the home one one time, <laughs> brother. Brother Rod, last Sunday he brought that little card I put on there. Preach like crazy. He's going to Big Springs for there. Preach like crazy. Go, go down there to the bank and deposit the money and go by the post office. Well, he's still at anyway. <laughs> When, when you think about what God's, he, here he is, this verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, I'm preaching like crazy up there. And this lady had played the piano for me. And she, she was up in here, she'd been in the home for several years. But she's a good piano player, especially when you got no music. And I'm, you know, they want to sing some of them old songs, which is great. I loved them. Anyways, we, we got to sing some of them. This one guy in there, he was so incredible. All he could say was, baby, 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 baby. But when we would start singing, he could sing the songs as clear as a bell. It was so precious. I'll fly away and when the roll is called up yonder and at the cross, at the cross, his little old mind would just clear out like all of a sudden. And as quick as we got through singing, he'd go back to baby, baby, and just to know it's in there. It's so pure spirit. Anyway, I was preaching and I was talking about that God gives you the power to not only forgive people, but to forget the puncture wound. And so when we got through, talking about bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, he said, put that where? Away from you and all malice. Malice is all about, wait till I get a hold of you. If I have to wait the rest of my life, I don't get mad, I get even. That's malice. I'm going to get you back. She come to me. And I mean, she was, I'd seen, I'd, I'd known her for quite a while, probably two, three years. She come to me and she said, I'm going to tell you something today, preacher. I said, okay, lay it on me. She was so mad. And she told me a story that whenever her son married, she stayed with them for a while. And then I'm sure she was having trouble and they put her in the home and she blamed her daughter-in-law. And she, I mean, she could just say that girl's name and there was a, I would choke you if I could get my hands on you to death and I'd laugh all the way to the grave side. And she said, I heard you say and you can forget it, but said that ain't even in the Bible. And I forgave her, but I will never forget it. And I said, baby, you haven't forgiven her if you can't forget it. And I said, it's not that you don't know what happened. But if you, if you can do what the Bible says, you can break the bitterness that's eating your container up. And she said, it's not in the Bible. And I said, well, what about Paul? She was a Sunday school teacher. I said, what about Paul? In Philippians, I believe it's chapter 3, Paul said, forgetting those things that's where? Behind me. And pressing forward to what's before me. I press toward the mark for the prize of what? The high call. The high call of God leads our speech to a different level. And our speech has power not to destroy people, but to lift them up. And so bitter wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking must be done something with it. What are we going to do with it? Cast it out of your system. In verse 32, he deals with the correct kind of feelings or attitudes. He says, three things here. Be kind to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. <clears throat> when you think about kindness, one writer said that kindness is in the Greek is krestos. C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S, Christos. The meaning is it's warm and it's attractive. Man, have you ever laid a snicker bar upon the dash of your pickup? How long does it take it to warm up 
and get pliable and juicy in the rapture. <laughs> it's not long that you take the wrapper off. You got, you got chocolate all over you. <laughs> Friend, don't you think it's time for us to warm up and be where we can get around people when they get away, they just can't get away from that. You've got all over them. <laughs> hey, where'd she get that on you? Well, well, guess where I've been? Well, why would you say a, why, how could you say something kind? And this, this word kindness, it comes from the thought of, of warm or attractive. It is goodness wearing a smile. It's goodness that draws you out by its warmth. I just got to see what that's like. You know the, the guy that made the microwave? He's a, he's a rich man. Because we don't like cold food. We don't like cold coffee. You may like it, but not me. I want it so hot it nearly burns the hair off your tongue. <laughs> In nature, warmth softens things. This warm kindness will soften our voice and it will soften our vocabulary. Connie called one of our church people. This has been years ago. So you, would, you wouldn't know if I called her name. Probably. <laughs> you remember. <laughs> she already knows who it is. She called her with something we didn't do very often. <laughs> she called her, hello, <laughs> on the other end of the line. And Connie said, this is Sister Connie. And she said, oh, Sister Connie. <laughs> I mean, it's all the way from I could choke you <laughs> with my little finger to, ooh, it would just drip it off the end of the phone. <laughs> Friends, Christianity puts you beyond hypocrisy. Come on. If you say it, you mean it. Right. Kindness cannot be, uh, real, real kindness cannot be hypocritical. Real kindness, if you're kind to people just to get something from them, you're, you're a spiritual thug yourself. I'm using sweet language now where you'll understand me. Okay, we're going on. Proverbs 15 and 1. We're talking about that candy bar up on the dash. <clears throat> a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words <laughs> stir up anger. If you want to start a fight, just go to digging on somebody. It won't be long. He said, Brother Messi, <laughs> he was talking about in his class this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. God, you got to help me before I go to cleaning this office out with this guy. Whoa! What is it? A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Mama called us in one day. was out in the, out in the garage working on a motor. And I mean, me and, me and Dad tore an old tractor down was rebuilding the motor on it. Called us in there and whenever she handed him the phone and he said, hello, that guy cussed my dad for, it seemed like 10 minutes. It was probably two or three, but I mean, the, I could hear him screaming over the phone wow. at daddy. And I mean, dad never said a word. He just, he just stood there and that guy, I mean, when he had peeled all the hide on him and used all the horrible language you could say, including a thief, and you'd use, you'd chingle me and, and beat me out of money and you hadn't paid your bill. And I mean, just. And daddy had made a tractor trade with this guy and uh, they hadn't finished it yet. And I mean, this guy's name was Herman. It, Really a nice man, but I mean, he was livid at this time. He owned a tractor dealership in uh, Stanford. When he got plumbed through, I was so mad at my dad, but I was so proud of him. I wanted to get in a pickup and go over there myself and say, you, you won't talk like that if you're standing in front of a guy. That's, that was my thinking, but my dad, you know what my dad said? His chocolate was already melted and it was running down the dash. He said, friend, and I thought, friend, yeah! <laughs> I thought this is the way we made the trade. And he walked Herman through. And I heard that man on the other end of the phone. He said, bear, while you was talking to me, I lifted up that big pad on my desk and right here's the trade. And it's exactly because it was over a three month period because the first tractor didn't work. He had sent another tractor to dad 
And anyway, you know, when you, you've got a plow with it, he's letting him try the tractor out to see if it's going. Anyway, he said, you are right on target. I have never been so wrong in my life, and I'm so sorry. And when he died, my dad and him were still good friends, and I learned a lesson of life. Let your chocolate run plumb down to the floorboard. A soft answer turns away wrath. Not another curse word, not another anger fit. I mean, the whole deal, it was God just set it up for a victory. So you don't know, man. I mean, words are powerful. I'm, I'm trying to hurry, but look at we talk all the time. Yeah. We, we could speak words that raise people up, that build them, that makes them different. The second one in this verse, in verse 32, is compassion. He talks about kindness, then he talks about compassion because he says uh, it deals with the correct kind of feeling attitudes. Be kind one to another. And then he said tender hearted. Tender hearted is you could kill them. They need to be killed with your words, but you're so tender hearted you just let it go by and you try to help them. That's against nature. <laughs> Compassion. Compassion is a sensitive person whose feelings can be touched by needs and problems of others. You're so caught up in what they need that you get past the trouble and you say, I'm, I'm going to help you anyway. Whoa, man. That's, that's in verse 32, uh, that middle word on it. Like the spirit of the good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, verse 33, what does he do? Two people pass, guy this, pass by this guy that's beat within a fraction of his life. He's laying there naked. He's been robbed. And uh, two clergymen pass him by. I hope they wasn't from Lighthouse. But that good Samaritan, he done something. He stopped. He went where he was. He gathered him. Oh, if, if, if Gunsmoke was watching, you'd be proud. It was going to be 30 more minutes. Come on now. Shake off them heavy bands. Lift up. Holy hands. Yeah. This, this good Samaritan man, I mean, he grabs that boy up. He pours in the oil and the wine. Boy, he rubs him around there. Gets some clothes out of his, out of his suitcase. Puts on him. Uh, gets him up on that burrow. Leads him down there to town. Stays with him as long as he can. Then he hires the man there. Said, you take care of this boy. I'll be coming back. If you spend another cent, when I come back through, I'll pay for it. Wow. Woo! What's that? That's compassion in reality. And the Lord wants that to come out in our life. It's easy for us to use communicational terrorism Yeah, we rule and destroy if necessary by destructive words. Like a political terrorist, we're ready to commit relational suicide rather than admit we're wrong. I'm not looking at you. We hold loved ones hostage through moodiness. I'm just mad and I don't care what kind of day you've had. Can we do that? Mm. What about guilt trips or what about other psychological sabotage? Whoa! Is that being compassionate? No. Oh, guilt trips. Okay, what's missing? I won't feel inclined to hurt you when your pain is mine and your grief touches me. And I can't be tough and indifferent when I'm in love with you. Whoa! Love changes the way we compassion people. Yeah. All of a sudden we say, you know what? I can just love them anyway. Wow! It's precious, isn't it? In Psalm 51 and verse 17, the writer tells us here, uh, this is David talking, look what he says. <clears throat> Psalm 51, verse number 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise when you see people hurting. Something happens. Why would you ever go to the penitentiary? It's a horrible place. But guess what? There's lots of hurting people out there. Whoa. And to see God touch them. Why would you go to the home or go to church? Wherever. Compassion. It drives us. One more. I'm closing. The last one he talks about in this verse number 32 about powerful speech is forgiveness. Wow. The soul from which grows words that impart grace to those that hear. Have you ever went to somebody and tried to ask them to forgive you and they, and they won't do it? Boy, that's a, that's a, that's a hurt. Boy. 
But when someone comes to you and they're, they're like that, like, I don't know if, how they're going to take this, but I've got I to gotta say it. And you say, hey, it's already forgiven. It's like, you mean I, I can talk to you? You mean we can be friends again? You mean we can get by this? Yeah. Whoa. You know why? That's the power of speech whenever forgiveness comes out of our mind. Say, yes, we can work this thing out. So this resource we have, when we need, se we need selective blindness that looks beyond the scars and focuses on the good instead of the bad. Man, my dad would take them old rank horses and he'd tell me, he said, there's some good in there somewhere. I'm just looking for it. <laughs> I mean, he had this horse that was nuts. That was his name. He called him friend. Daddy had had him for about six months. I mean, the closest you could get to was the end of a rope. He was just like a panther. He just roll, snort rollers. Well, he, had, he saddled him every day. And he finally said, he said, I think he's getting close to where I'm going to ride him. And, and I said, man, Randy was fixing to catch a bus. Man, we're going to catch a bus at 730. Just got daylight. I said, Dad, please get on him before we leave. You can't get on him without us seeing you. So, Dad, I mean, he stepped up on that Bronk and he, I mean, he went to balling and pitching. He makes about six jumps and hits a, a milk shed. I mean, the saddle horn wouldn't hardly go under the shed. And dad just steps down. That horse bucks up through under the milk shed, hangs himself in one of the rafters. The horn, you know, sticks out like that. He jumps up, hits the top of the barn and hangs right there. He's going, wah, 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 about three jumps hanging on the horn. Comes out of there, bucks a circle, bucks through a six plank fence. And the bus comes. Oh, no! <laughs> no! No, 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 no! And dad catches him and steps on him, and I mean, he's going out across the field the last time I seen him. And I can't wait to get home. Whatever, whatever. Oh, we got some good in there somewhere. We just got to find it. I mean, he bucked every time he got on him. Whoa, he was... He was rank. <laughs> Ask Randy. He bucked him off smooth. <laughs> like I killed him. <laughs> oh, don't you love it? What's forgiveness about? Oh, he got some good in there somewhere. I really don't belong to him. Probably somebody started him wrong. That's what. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Where does that come from? The power of speech. The people that owned him said this horse will probably never be rode. He's an out. Law. He was about five years old. You don't break them at five most time. You when they're about two years old. Big old stuff. I mean, as good looking ponies you ever laid your eyes on. But I'm telling you, he was like a panther. I was begging that. Said dad, you got to let me ride him. He said, son. He said, could I just show you something? I said, okay. I mean, he been he done rode him three or four times. I said, it's my turn. I mean, I'm like nine years old. I said, I got to get some of this. So he, he saddled him and rode him down to the road about, I don't know, 200 yards. And he turned him around and just broke him into a long lope. And he got about halfway back. And I mean, that horse went nearly as high as this ceiling. And, just, and he bucked blind. He bucked right into the side of the barn, into the side of the tractor. When he went to bucking, he, didn't, he wouldn't live in. He was bucking. He didn't care where. He'd have bucked off the edge of the Grand Canyon and kissed it goodbye and smiled all the way to the bottom. <laughs> He didn't care. And when he broke into it, he was crazy. And I mean, he took about five jumps. I'd never seen my dad bucked off. He, except one time off a little Shetland. He fell off backers. <laughs> but anyway, this horse, he got right there. He bucked right up against us. And dad just stepped down and grabbed him, jerked him around. I mean, yeah, that horse is bucking like crazy. And he's whooping him in the, in the face with his hat, trying to get his attention. He said, yeah, here, yeah, quit that. He said, I just tell you, I just want to show you, you're not quite ready for him yet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, friends, there's some stuff out there you're not ready for if you don't get your speech fixed. Yeah, you will be a person that claims Christianity that never gets to the portals of glory because the Lord. Okay, I'm going to close with this if I can find it. I'm, I'm trying to close. Okay, maybe I can't find it. Only tender hearts produce words that heal rather than hurt. You may remember the scripture and you can look it up yourself, but it says, by your words. Thou shalt be justified. And by your words. Friends, your, word, your words is powerful stuff. What you say, you may be like a motor mouth that don't shut up, but you're going to give an account. And so am I. Every one of us will give an account one of these days. So I, I'm not beating you up. I don't want to whoop on you. I love you. 
And I love you so much, I want your words to be so powerful that when you say something, it edifies, yes. it's constructive, it's good, and it's appropriate. Wow. These altars are open. Revival's on the road. Woo! Come on in here. You had a hump in your back all day. It's time to get out here and pray through. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> If you can't come down here, you're welcome to kneel. But God bless you as you come and wait before the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.